A very good afternoon. I am Dr. Basuraj Kuntoji, working as a consultant physician and intensivist at Manipal Hospital, Malayshuram. For the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, I would like to speak to you about uh, outpatient basis management of COVID infection. And thereby, we'll also see whether we can reduce the number of admissions as much as possible. I'll be talking to you about uh, the introduction to understand the OPD basis management, when to suspect COVID for the first time, and uh, when to send for uh, RT-PCR, when we should get a chest X-ray, HRCT chest, depending on the timeline basis. We know if ABU are inconclusive, what we should do the next. And once these are conclusive, what uh, we can do the management as an outpatient basis or a home care treatment wise. I will also go through the various medications that what we can use and its adverse effects. And we all know how often we need to see the patient as an OPD basis or a tele-OPD basis. And uh, when and how to suspect that this patient needs an admission and not to forget the non-COVID diseases during this pandemic also. The whole topic depends on a fact that the COVID-19 infection, 80% of such patients can be treated as an outpatient basis treatment. That means 80% of COVID infected patients, we can manage them as a home care based treatment. But however, 15 to 20% of the patients requires admission and 5% of these patients require an ICU admission also. So hence, here I would like to highlight when we are taking care of the patients at home, how we can prevent them getting admission. But however, in spite of this, some patients do need admission and as well as an ICU care. And uh, this is what I'm going to speak to you based on the OPD patients that I have seen since last three months, maybe around 3000 patients that uh, I'm, I have seen uh, over a period of last uh, three months uh, period, wherein we have, I mean, I have tried to manage them at uh, home uh, based treatment or an OPD based treatment, and also try to uh, detect early that when they can require an admission. The four most important thing that what we need to understand is what is an incubation period in COVID-19. An incubation period is the time between when you contract a virus and when your symptoms start. We all know generally it is two to 14 days after the exposure and the average incubation period seems to be around five days. Sometimes it can be seven days and sometimes as I informed as late as 11 day, 12 day also patients have become symptomatic. Why this incubation period is important uh, is the many patients will ask you I had been in contact with the so-and-so person uh, four days or five days back and they will do the RT-PCR immediately within two days and they say they are negative and they seem they feel that we are out of COVID and hence they get relaxed. Hence this incubation period is important uh, to know when to test the patient and when they may become symptomatic. This is what is very important for high-risk contacts. High-risk contacts, we know that patients who have been with the COVID positive patients in the past without wearing a mask, spending more than five or 15 minutes. So these high-risk contacts, we need to know that incubation period ranges from two to 14 days. And hence, we need to test them after seven days of the last exposure. Going to a pathophysiology, Yes, after the incubation period gets over, then the virus in that particular person starts multiplying in the cells of the body and these virus will multiply and they will start causing a viremia. And this viremia only will lead on to the fever, body pain, headache, myalgia, most commonly in the initial three to five days period of time. And we have, we have got several patients who have got these symptoms only for one day or two day or three day, and then they subside. And they feel that 
they are they are they are out of covid infection because they are feeling better but most importantly what we need to understand is from this time onwards there are around 30 to 40% of the patients who will continue to remain asymptomatic even at the end of 10 days and 12 days and they will they and they will for them we can say that yes they are uh, out of covid complications but however after these uh, 3 to 4 days of illness when it starts subsiding few of the patients will land up into the second uh, week or what i call between the 5 to 10 days period during this time they may again start having the fever cough breathlessness so this is what we call host inflammatory response phase wherein the host will start having hyper inflammatory response or there may be a thrombotic response so this period is the most important for a clinicians like us to detect as well as treat them as well as decide when they need an admission so this is what is the second phase what we call post inflammatory hyper response or a thrombotic uh, phase and and as i as i mentioned these in during this period we need to find out uh, and treat appropriately and see uh, and prevent whether they can go into the moderate or severe infection and thereby prevent the hospital admission uh, as i told you incubation period on an average is 5 days example a person has met his friend on april 25th so from april 25th he has met a friend who was covid positive and now the person x who has met y y was a covid positive patient and the person x uh, isolates him, himself for 5 days or 6 days and during this period he remains asymptomatic but after 5 days of the incubation period he may develop uh, signs and symptoms so that means approximately on 1st of may he may develop signs and symptoms like fever body pain myalgia and all so i divide them into mainly the two phase that is the initial viremia phase that is first 5 to 7 days which is a viremia phase and uh, most of the symptoms symptoms in most of the individuals will will subside but however after 5 to 7 day i mean during this 5 to 7 days very few patients may continue to have fever persisting beyond 5 to 7 days also but after 5 to 7 days for the patients where the fever has subsided or for the patients where the fever is continuing in them the host inflammatory response will happen and then they start manifesting with cough fever breathlessness chest tightness and all so during this phase is the most important and crucial phase for all of us to recognize these symptoms and start treatment appropriately as early as possible as well as find out when they require an admission the alert sign for the home care as a, as, or as an outpatient department treatment is if they start saying that they are having breathlessness after going to the washroom some patients will say that they have got a chest tightness or a chest compression sometimes they may not be exactly able to express these words but we need to ask a leading questions uh, like do you have a chest compression do you have a chest tightness are you feeling breathlessness then they may come out come out and say yes they are having these symptoms and an extreme fatigue that means that they are unable to sit stand walk and most of the time they uh, they are sleepy and especially in elderly this is the most common symptom that what we see they may not be having fever they may not be expressing you a breathlessness but they say they are completely fatigued they are not eating anything and uh, the loss of appetite feeling very fatigued most of the times they are uh, sleepy and when you check their saturation saturation may be less than 94 92 some of the young patients will have a continuous excess cough the excess bouts of cough they are not able to speak also and during the each sentence also they will express they will having they will having a deep uh, cough uh, cough uh, when these symptoms are present this is the period where we say the viremia phase is over but they are in a hyper immune response uh, phase and we need to treat these patients uh, appropriately at this point of time oxygenation is been given a very high importance for the admission but however as we all know that we have got two uh, lungs and we also know that even if the one lung is not maintaining only if the other lung 
can function and the saturation can be 98 even with one lakh. So what we need to understand is that for the saturation to become less than 94%, there has to be at least 25% to 50% of the total lung capacity might be going low, only then the saturation drops. So hence, hence we cannot or we should not depend only on the oxygen level going less than 94% and only then we have to ask them to get admitted. But however, as I said, we need to take this also into account apart from their breathlessness, chest tightness, chest compression and extreme fatigue, especially more so in elderly individual. The other important point is if a person is having a high grade fever beyond seven days. So these are the patients where again, we need to be uh, cautious and treat them apart appropriately. Uh, the lot of patients come back to us saying that their HRCT CT, uh, CT scoring is uh, so and so, hence what needs to be done. HRCT will not give us any importance if we are doing within five days of their symptom onset. So hence, we should decide that if they require HRCT, we should advise them to do after five days, preferably on sixth or seventh day of their illness. That will give us actual importance of the lung involvement. If we do within five days of the symptom onset, HRCT may show it is normal and it will give the wrong, wrong, import, wrong importance also. HRCT may not be required if the patients are symptomatically doing well at home. So hence, if they have got these symptoms, if sometimes if the RT-PCR is negative, then we can think of getting the HRCT to diagnose the COVID infection. And other important point is, when we call with respect to oxygenation, we call it as mild if the saturation is less than 94%. Whereas in HRCT, we call it as mild when the score is less than nine out of 25 or less than 11 out of 40 but both may not correlate. We have seen patients where the score is 18 or 20 or even 22 out of 40, but their oxygen level is more than 94%. So hence, do not depend only on the HRCT scoring and then admit, depend on all other above mentioned signs and then decide whether we can continue treating them at home or whether such patients requires an admission. Only other thing what we can mention is, as we all know, the other viral infection is dengue fever. So we all know dengue fever used to, I mean, we all have treated dengue fever enough number of patients every year. What we know from dengue fever is these patients of dengue fever will have a fever of two days, three days, four days period. And as the fever subsides, they will end up with complications like thrombocytopenia, dengue hemorrhagic fever, polycerositis only. So exactly the same thing will happen also. Hence, in COVID infection, once the fever myalgia subsides, do not think that they're totally all right, but we need to keep a close watch on them, especially between five to 10 days or between seven to 12 days after the symptom onset is what I wanted to highlight here. When to suspect or send the further infection? Uh, RT-PCR test especially has to be done in a high risk contacts, as I mentioned, on uh, beyond seventh day or 10th day of the previous contact. Even if they've got mild symptoms of throat pain or the fever, body pain, they need to be tested for RT-PCR. There are few patients wherein we have seen they may not express appropriate symptoms and they attribute their symptoms for allergy or the dust or the previous uh, illness of their experience. Hence, we need to speak to them in person to the patient or even if the elderly individual, and we need to advise them, yes, you need to get the RT-PCR test. The high risk contacts, which I mentioned that in these individuals, preferably uh, uh, the advice of COVID RT-PCR has to be done on seventh or eighth day, or if they develop symptoms earlier, then also the test has to be done. There is also a question, if person develops the symptoms, whether we should then send on the same day or the previous day or the next day. It is advisable that if a person develops a fever, a cough or breathlessness or a body pain, either one day prior or one day prior on the same day of the illness or maybe the next day itself, the COVID RT-PCR can pick up if they are COVID positive. So hence, do not delay getting the RT-PCR test done 
thinking that it may it may come negative when they already having a fever cough or breathlessness and we have seen several patients the rt pcr comes negative but patient continues to have symptoms so what what we can do the next so as i mentioned if the patient is having uh, symptoms of uh, viral infection and if the rt pcr comes negative so do not think that it is negative so hence how we can diagnose that they are having covid infection what is the next modality is if the rt pcr is negative if they continue to have symptoms we can also ask them to do an hrct test beyond 5 days or 6 days remember if you do within 5 days of symptoms again the hrct may not pick up or if they are hypoxic you can do the same day and say that ct scan also will will pick up the covid infection very rarely we have also seen the patients had a uh, symptoms almost a uh, 10 days or 14 days back and they are totally uh, cured of infection some of the other family members started having a fever in them we can also do a covid antibody we know that covid antibody generally starts appearing after 15 days but with our experience in the patients who are admitted these covid antibody can present as early as 7 days or 8 days itself so hence wherever the rt pcr has come negative and if the hrct also has not picked up sometimes we can ask the covid antibody and we may feel i mean we may we may not be surprised that covid antibody may come positive so hence any one of these things are present we should be able to treat them i am talking about the covid antibody during the illness within 10 days 12 days period the antibody when we do beyond 14 days that is different this is when the acute viral or the hyper immune response is happening how to diagnose we can use this covid antibody test also and meantime whether these report comes positive or negative continue treating patients according to their symptoms and signs hence do not wait for any of these reports to come either positive or negative and what one need to remember also at the end of all these things we need to keep a close watch also on the non covid disease because we are seeing a patient who is having a fever of 15 days or 3 uh, weeks or four, or a month duration when we have done a ct test we have found that patient might have turned into a, uh, a tuberculosis disease patient might have turned into uh, uh, other chest infection also so hence or hence also keep in mind there are non covid disease which can exist also during the pandemic situation also okay so we have confirmed the covid infection with various parameters then what are the outpatient outpatient basis or home care basis treatment that are available and the other question also comes when we should do the viral markers so i would suggest the viral markers can be sent on either on um, uh, third or fifth day of the symptom and if they are abnormal and if a patient continues to have symptoms we may repeat again after third day if a patient is getting better at home if the patient is improving in them there is no need to do the uh, blood test or the viral markers or even the hrct test also how often we need to see the patient yes generally we advise uh, for the first time when we consulted if they are not getting better you please again get back to me either tomorrow or or, or within 2 3 days wherever you have found or you are having some doubts that this patient is a, a high risk individual who may require admission or who may require close contacts you please ask them that whether you can look after them either twice daily even at the home care uh, basis uh, or as an outpatient basis or at least the next day you can uh, do a follow up so what are the various medications we have and its adverse effects so we have the hydroxychloroquine ivermectin favipiravir and the monoclonal antibody and colchicine which can be used as an outpatient basis management uh, other apart from this we also have uh, symptomatic treatment which we can use paracetamol or we can use the antihistamines and the antibiotics also can be used and the specific treatment even in these individuals i will say the steroids may benefit in a selected uh, selected individuals coming back to the hydroxychloroquine what we used in the last uh, year that the hydroxychloroquine we use it as a prophylaxis we use it a treatment also but in this pandemic yes hydroxychloroquine still may have a role in pregnancy because this is the only safest drug that what 
we can use in the pregnancy. But however, it is not for all COVID positive patients in the pregnancy. In the selected individuals, we can still choose the hydroxychloroquine because the other drugs like ivermectin and uh, uh, the favipiravir are not to be used in pregnancy. Coming to the ivermectin, there are various uh, trials, including Ivercor COVID-19 study, same trials are still ongoing. But with the available uh, data, ivermectin can be used as prophylactic medication, as well as it can be used as therapeutic medication also. Uh, the dose is also a controversial, but to make it very simple, you can use the ivermectin 12 mg once daily for three days, or as a therapeutic also 12 mg once daily for three days to a maximum five days one can use. But however, one need to be cautious that ivermectin whenever used also can cause the arthralgia and diarrhea. So some of the patients when, uh, when they come with arthralgia, we need to also check whether they have got, uh, they're on these medications and uh, Many of the times, the medication itself may be causing more symptoms and signs than the disease itself. Coming to the favipiravir, yes, I am not discussing about uh, its uh, dose and all. I am mainly highlighting it also can lead on to the adverse effects like GI symptoms, like uh, vomiting and loose motion. Some patients have got a CNS abnormality, feeling very, very fatigued. Sometimes even the altered sensorium also for feeling some abnormal behavior. It also has got adverse effects on the liver also. Hence, we need to be careful on these adverse effects also. Coming to the antihistamines, yes, antihistamines has to be used if they are having a running nose or nasal block during the early stage. But many of the patients may come back saying that they are having a drowsiness or many of the patients also will have a dryness of the mouth. So if they are having a dryness of the mouth, we need to be cautious whether we should ask them to continue these antihistamines or not. The desloratadine also can cause uh, diarrhea and dryness of the mouth and, and, and vomiting. So hence, in such situation, I would advise uh, to stop the medications and give symptomatic treatment for the vomiting and diarrhea and many of the patients improve without these medications. Uh, coming to the, uh, the most important thing is about the steroids. Uh, the first uh, point is about the equivalent dose of the steroids. The hydrocortisone of 160 mg is equivalent to the prednisolone of 40 mg. The, uh, the prednisolone of 40 mg and it is equivalent to methyl prednisolone of 32 mg and dexona of 60 mg. We have got hydrocortisone available in the IV form as well as a, a oral form. Prednisolone is available again as a oral, methyl prednisolone uh, again as IV and oral. Dexona also is IV and oral. Some of the patients that I've seen, Dexona, since the tablet is available as 0.5, 4, and 6 mg, some of the patients have taken only 0.5 mg, thinking that it will give them a good relief. So hence, this is hence I have written the what is the equivalent dose that one, if we are using. Uh, what is the dose uh, has to be used. There are various trials have been done on steroids, mainly the recovery trial, CODEX trial, Cape COVID trial, meta-analysis of uh, the steroid trial. All these trials have shown that patients who are moderate and severely ill COVID infection, steroid has got a definite role and it prevents the mortality also. So can we, uh, can we utilize these for our patients who are on outpatient basis who are on uh, uh, home care treatment, when to use steroids is very, very, is very important. So as I told, once the viremia phase gets over, suppose the patient has had fever for one or two days and his next two, three days is asymptomatic. And after sixth or seventh day, he starts having a cough. So this is where, this is where I feel that he has completed his viremia phase and he's into the Hyper immune or uh, uh, thrombotic phase. These are the uh, this is the period where if the patient continues to be symptomatic, which I told you previously, if they have breathlessness, chest tightness, if uh, uh, they complains of extreme fatigue, still steroid has got a role in these patients. Sometimes I feel the guideline says that if you have to use steroids if the saturation is less than 94%, and as I mentioned. For the saturation, 
to, to become less than 94%, almost half of the lung or 40 or 50% of the patient's, uh, patient's lung has to be affected only when the saturation becomes less and by that time we might have missed the bus. So hence, we can use this during uh, when the viremia phase gets over, if they start having these symptoms, we, we, we can use the steroids. But we should also be knowing when not to use steroids. If a patient is having diabetic ketoacidosis, of course, the sugars are high. So hence, in these individuals, uh, should, steroids, steroids should not be used. However, as soon as you control the sugar, as soon as you control the ketoacidosis, if the patient continues to be symptomatic, if they require oxygen, th uh, uh, oxygen uh, therapy, and if they are still in a hyperimmune phase, we can restart the steroids also. The other thing that what we need to remember is about the mucormycosis. If a person who is having a unilateral headache, facial pain, blurring of vision, in them we need to suspect, check our uh, uh, OPD uh, treatment chart. If they are on steroids, we need to stop steroids also in, in such individuals. What to monitor? Yes, whenever we prescribe steroids, we need to inform the inform the patient or their family that we need to check their sugar level. Sugar level of more than 300, 400, continue them with the steroids. Again, it is not going to help them. Uh, during this uh, hyper, the, during this, once the viremia phase gets over, during this between five to seven days, up to 10 or 12 days of management at home, they may, management at home, when they develop these alert signs and uh, symptoms, we can start the steroids. The dosage also is important. It all depends on how the patient is, how severe the symptoms are there. What I personally use is use a methyl prednisolone, which I mentioned, uh, per day dose of uh, 32 mg for initial one day or two day. And uh, later on, you can taper. Suppose this patient who are hypoxic, if they are getting admitted, we know that we use the methyl prednisolone as high as 40 mg uh, twice daily. That means 80 mg twice daily. So depending on each patient's symptoms, we can tend to use the higher dose of steroids. But depending on the patient's symptoms, we can use the lesser dose of oral steroids in a selected group of individuals. And we should not assume that, yes, we have started steroids on a home care basis and these patients will become better. No. Uh, as far as uh, my experience goes, treating, as I mentioned, various patients, out of 10 of these selected group of patients, seven to eight patients will definitely respond well to the steroids, but another two or three patients may not respond to the steroids. Either in them, we need to use the higher dose of steroids or such patients needs early admission to the hospital and then they may require various modality of hospital-based treatment. And uh, uh, steroids also have got an adverse events. And uh, if we think that yes, steroids has helped and patient is getting better and maybe after four days or five days, if their symptoms recur, if they again start having fever, if they become hypoxic, if they start having cough, we need to suspect there may be an additional uh, bacterial or a possible fungal infection also we need to suspect. We need to ask a very leading question like, do you have a burning sensation in the mouth? Examine the mouth for oral candidiasis. You ask specific question in genitalia, do you have a white discharge or the uh, white uh, discharge in the uh, penile area? And then they may come out, yes, they want these symptoms and hence, uh, watch for the adverse effects and we need to uh, uh, we need to detect them early and as well as treat them early also. This is what I was trying to say. The first week within the five to seven days is the viral stage and the second week is the cytokine storm or the hyperimmune response wherein few of the patients may have got tiredness, body ache, cold, cough, fever which may be persisting or it might have gone. And in a selected group of individuals, what I said is whether we can use the steroid at these selected group of individuals, but do not use during the viremia phase. But what the guidelines have recommended is use it beyond uh, when they become hypoxic, when they get admitted to the hospital. But I feel by this time we might have missed the bus. And hence, if we treat them 
for these alert signs and symptoms. And if we can also know the adverse event of the steroids, we can use it earlier also in a selected group of patients and thereby prevent their admission. But at the same time, do not think that, yes, we have started steroids, hence everything will be taken care of by them. We need to keep a close watch. Few of the patients still require an admission for the further uh, care as well as management. We are seeing uh, patients whose saturation was around 89, 90, and uh, they are breathless, they are hypoxic, and they are unable to get the bed. So in them, yes, the oral steroids, depending on their symptoms, as I mentioned, either the methylprednisolone of 16 mg per day, as high as 32 mg per day, in a very rare cases, still higher dose per day, has definitely helped them. And the next day, they, when they come for follow-up, they are told, yes, they are symptomatically better, their oxygenation also has improved. But along with this, we also should advise doing the incentive spirometry so that their breathing capacity improves and the deep breathing exercise, whatever they uh, know. And also the prone position at their home also will definitely help to improve the oxygen. We all know if such patients are admitted to the hospital, obviously we'll advise them for this prone position, deep breathing exercise and incentive spirometry also. Uh, coming to the steroid inhaler, uh, uh, most of the patient who have got a symptomatic cough or an extreme cough, the steroid inhaler definitely has helped them. We need, we can use the Bidocart inhaler, 800 mics or up, or up to 1,200 mics per day. So we should be knowing when we prescribe inhaler, the budenicide inhaler comes as 100 or 200 mics. So we need to decide. Uh, about 800 mics per day that what we can use. Similarly, the rotilor also comes as 100 or 200. Similarly, nebulization also comes around the 500 mics in each uh, respures. So we need to advise the steroid inhaler. Definitely the cough will get much better with the uh, steroid inhaler. And the studies also have proven, especially for home care basis, the steroid inhaler will help for the symptomatic cough relief. But the word of advice again here, after, take, after they take either inhaler, rotile or nebulization, they need to clean their mouth as well as the throat with, uh, with, uh, by gargling so that the steroid doesn't uh, uh, remain there and it should not lead on to the further uh, adverse effects such as uh, infection. So with, uh, with this, I would like also to highlight about outpatient basis management of the patients who were admitted to the hospital, who have recovered and who have discharged back to home. In them also, we get a tele-OPD as well as they also come back saying that they've got an extreme weakness and what to, what to treat. Most of the patients, yes, uh, uh, when they continue a good, uh, a good food, home food, as well as when you give a vitamin B12 supplementation, if required the vitamin D supplementation, they do improve, but however, we should not chase the weakness. We need to ask specific question. Is the weakness is getting better every day or the, is the weakness is getting worsened? If the weakness is getting worsened in such patients or if they've got a fever, again, we need to suspect that they may be having a secondary bacterial or fungal infection. And hence, we should not chase only about the COVID infection at this point of time. Hence, in these individuals, we may have to send a repeat blood test blood culture, urine culture, and we may have to start the antibiotics and if required the antifungals also, and most of them do, and most of them do well also. So with this, uh, with this, I would uh, like to thank you. Hope uh, this has uh, helped you to manage uh, the alert symptoms and signs, as well as how we can treat them as an OPD basis management, but wherever it is required, we need to inform them earlier, yes, this patient needs an admission, hence these patients has to be referred for an admission to the hospital also. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Yeah, I have a question for you. Yes. Yeah, actually you... Uh, talking about some non-COVID related diseases, which we need to be careful while treating the cases nowadays. And uh, actually, to be frank, we are getting so many cases with fever and sometimes even with a cold cough also. 
and sometimes with only fever and body pain and sometimes with fever with like uh, some gastric related symptoms so all these like uh, we can't ask patient to go for rt pcr for everyone so now on my point my question is like how to differentiate across these cases and how to deal with these cases if at all if any of the cases have turned to be covid so how can we differentiate between those uh, parameters which are uh, nowadays we are uh, checking in the covid cases like uh, rt pcr not only rt pcr crp levels d dimer all these things so is there any conditions where these also can be like elevated apart from covid so these are two questions of mine basically to you okay if i understood well because i was not able to hear you the question one is about uh, how to keep a watch on a non covid disease uh, during the pandemic yes the first differential diagnosis has to be covid we need to see that we uh, do them the covid uh, test and also continue monitoring their symptoms and if you are unable to do uh, if the covid rt pcr is negative as i mentioned beyond 6 or 7 days yes we should do the ct chest also and if this all comes negative and if you think that yes there is something different than what we commonly see in covid patients we need to keep a watch on non covid disease especially after getting a ct scan few very few patients have also turned into be a uh, to be a tuberculosis and we have sent a sputum afb and that has turned out to be a positive and such patients have been running around various hospitals getting rt pcr again and again and they were unable to diagnose but of late since the ct has been much earlier we were able to detect these non covid issues especially by doing a ct scan but yes there are patients even at the end of uh, uh, 15 days or 10 days of therapy thinking of it, the covid this is the covid but we need to keep a close watch uh, that whether the non covid disease Uh, also is possible so what i mean is during the pandemic yes covid does exist but we need to think of non covid this is also depending on their various symptoms and signs okay there is a, a question from dr naresh when we use steroids on opd basis which is better is it a 5 days course or taper over 15 days uh i have mentioned the alert signs and uh, symptoms especially after the viremia gets over the steroids has to be steroids can be used which is better uh but yes either we can use uh hydrocortisone which has got glucocorticoid action 1 is to 1 or we can use prednisolone which has got a four glucocorticoid action and one mineralocorticoid action and when we come to methyl prednisolone it has got 5 is to 1 but dexona is the only drug which has got the highest glucocorticoid anti inflammatory action so that is 20 is to 1 so when you want the highest anti inflammatory uh, dose then dexona tablet can be used but however the getting a dexona tablet of 4 mg 6 mg is rare so hence sometimes the 0.5 mg only is given and they have been asked to take twice daily there are some prescription where it is written dexona 0.5 mg take twice daily it is not going to help so hence either you use a dexona tablet 6 mg per day or a methyl prednisolone which i mentioned ranging from 8 mg to 32 mg very rarely higher dose than this or the hydrocortisone dose which i mentioned the equivalent dose so these are can be used yes uh, initially for two days three days three days they may require the highest dose but as early as possible you try to taper over a period of 7 days or maybe up to 9 days because we know that moderate to severe cases 10 days steroid is what been advised and then either taper and stop similarly the same thing we can use it here but again what i mentioned is this has to be only after the viremia phase gets over in a selected group of patients with a particular symptoms and signs this can be used is what i feel the next question is from sushma sir the d dimer test done after a covid recovery is about 2000 and it is not coming down 
Yes. So whenever the patient get discharged, we do ask them to come back after one week with a repeat D dimer or and along with a sugar test done because we know that sugar can vary. We need to know whether uh, it is under control or not. With respect to specifically the D dimer, yes, there are patients where the D dimer remains high. If the patient is getting symptomatically better, we can counsel that yes, not to worry about this. But however, the oral anticoagulants can be given at home and you again repeat a D-dimer after seven days. Oral, oral anticoagulants uh, may be like uh, uh, apixibumab or, uh, or the, any other oral anticoagulant, you can use it an appropriate dose. And most of them, the D-dimers, when you repeat after seven days, it will come back to normal and you should be able to manage them as an outpatient basis only. The next question is, ideal time to send lab investigation, whether we need all viral markers or basic blood investigations enough is initial. So what I advise is, when we treat them as an outpatient basis or a home care basis, look at the symptoms and signs. If the symptoms or signs are getting better at their home, such patients, there is no need of doing any blood test for them. If beyond third day, if they continue to have symptoms, we should not be missing the severity of illness also. So hence, I would advise if they continue to have symptoms beyond third day, or if the symptoms are increasing beyond third day or fifth day, yes, we can have a blood investigation as a basic parameters out of which, out of which the CBC in which the total count as well as neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, D-dimer and CRP may help at this point of time when they are at home-based treatment is what I would advise. They need not be on all the blood tests can be done. And if they are getting better, there is no need to repeat the test. And if they're worsening, we can do the test again after two days only for the comparison. But I would believe in patient symptoms and signs rather than these viral markers because we have seen patients CRP of 256 and IL-6 of 200, but the patients are doing very well. Whereas the IL-6 is only 5 and the CRP levels are also very low and the patients are not doing. Hence, correlate the symptoms with the investigations and then decide what needs to be done. But sometimes if you go on a reverse way, like CR CRP is high, and the viral markers are high, but the patient is doing well. In such situations, we can wait for further escalation of the treatment. The next question is, Lina Mukun, what kind of pharyngitis is seen in uh, COVID? Uh, to be frank, generally we tend to avoid examining the oral cavity or the throat, but yes, if we are doing a tele-OPD consultation, we we can see their uh, throat also, but in, in patients also, yes, we have seen their throat. I'm not sure what kind of pharyngitis, but this pharyngitis also do very well respond when we start them on steroids if they are beyond the viremia phase also. And if required, we need to take a ENT consultation also. Some patients do have lymphadenitis and we need to decide is it a disease or is it an adverse effect of any of the drugs which is causing uh, other issues also we need to keep in mind. The Syed, Syed has asked whether aspirin can be used. Uh, yes, when the anticoagulation is required, whenever you suspect uh, somebody's D-dimer is high and if they are risk individuals to develop into the arterial thrombus, like uh, MI, like uh, uh, lower limb arterial ischemia, like uh, stroke, in such individuals, aspirin can be used along with the oral anticoagulants also. But however, we need to see that uh, the aspirin alone itself can cause the adverse effects. So whenever we are prescribing, ask specific questions, whether they can tolerate or is there, a, uh, is there any uh, severe gastritis or is there any blood loss that also has to be asked. Yes, we can use aspirin maybe along with the uh, and oral anticoagulants uh, when the D-dimer levels are high. The next question is, 
how to treat for increased ferritin and LDH. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, correlate the symptoms and signs along with the ferrit, along with the blood reports. If the patient is doing well, do not worry of do not worry about the ferritin and LDH levels. If the patient is having more symptoms and signs in them, if the ferritin and LDH levels are also high in them, yes, the steroids will definitely help them. But however, again, do not think that steroids will take care of everything. You please keep a close watch and decide when to admit for the next therapy that is required. So have a, a clinical assessment of the overall patients and treat the patients and you may use the viral markers uh, in a particular individuals to see that these markers are improving or getting better. But however, I personally feel the symptoms and signs are the main important things rather than these numbers that what we get. The next question again is about the same. Sir, how to manage high ferritin levels? A lot of importance is being given about these markers, including the ferritin. There are patients who have recovered and who have got discharged, but when you have checked their ferritin levels are high, like 1,500, 2,000 and all. If the patients are doing well, so not to, not to, not to worry among these patients and these ferritin levels and the CRP levels will, will come down. If the patients are having symptoms, yes, we need to escalate the treatment. Uh, so hence, correlate their reports only with their symptoms and signs but just do not read only these numbers. The next question is, one patient after discharging was sent on anticoagulant for 15 days. He was fine until then. Uh, oral anticoagulant at the time of discharge may not be required for all the patients. And as I mentioned, if they have got a high risk of having possible thrombus burden and if the D-dimers levels are high two times or three times, yes, in them we can use the oral anticoagulants because when you start working in a CCU or in neurosurgery uh, wards or the ICU, there are several patients post-COVID, they have landed with an MI, they have landed with a stroke and they have landed with a non-ST elevation MI. So hence, we are not sure, the evidence is not sure, but however, we can use them, the oral anticoagulants, if these symptoms, if the uh, D-dimer levels are high in at the time of discharge. The next question is, when to start Clexane? Uh, as I am discussing here about the home care management as well as the OPD basis management, I feel there is no, re there is no role of giving a Clexane as a home, home, home based management. There is no need to give any oral anticoagulants. What we're trying to see is an outpatient management starting from the symptom onset up to seven days or, or up to 10 days. And with, after viremia phase goes off, after five to seven days, we need to keep a close watch on them that are the symptoms are getting better or getting worsened. If they're worsened, yes, as an inpatient, uh, if they require an inpatient, definitely we need to use the Clexane after they get admitted either uh, prof either uh, 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 either once daily or in a given situation twice daily, but however, the evidence is still not clear. So hence, when we are treating them as a outpatient basis management, the, uh, there is no need of giving them a Clexane at their home is what I feel. Next question is by Dr. Sanjit. His follow-up D-dimer also was normal. From next day, patients started developing restlessness and sleeplessness. After one week of D-dimer levels were 1,300. Are the symptoms related to D-dimer level? It is very unlikely that D-dimer level itself will cause the symptoms. D diver level is a marker that whether the patient can land up with can land up with a venous uh, thrombosis or an arterial thrombosis. So hence we need to decide that whether the patient is having a stroke or a venous or a cerebral venous thrombosis. 
and hence whether he's in an altered sensorium. But however, we need to uh, also look at other parameters and rule out, are there any other causes for restlessness or sleeplessness? And most of the times we need to get and check their drug list, what they're taking and, some, and sometimes the medications itself may be causing and in spite of stopping that if they continue to have a sleeplessness or a restlessness, we need to evaluate further, further. but d diver level alone may not cause the restlessness or sleeplessness unless the patient has landed with the complications. The next question is by Dr. Vikram. We uh, keep seeing GP starting on anti-flu or flu as soon as the rat is positive or even mild symptoms. Is this advisable? In my opinion, the previous guideline we started, I mean, last year, we started having a guideline saying that it can be H1N1. So hence, you start adding flu before, before the report comes. But we know that this is a pandemic of COVID. We have not seen any H1N1 infection. And we know that starting, uh, starting the oseltamivir is not going to uh, is not going to help. So hence, definitely oseltamivir. If you are talking about the fluvir treatment, is is there is no role in treating COVID infection. The second one, I think, if you are asking about favi favi hour, I think I will read the question again. Favi flu as soon as the rat is positive or even the mild symptoms is this advisable. As I mentioned, the antivirals, what we can use is, as an organ, as we use either the hydroxychloroquine or the ivermectin or the favipiravir. In my understanding, we are not sure how much any one of these is going to help. Yes, if you believe that favipiravir helps, yes, you can use it once the patient is having symptoms as well as once it is turned, to be a, turned out to be a COVID positive. But however, we need to know that favipiravir uh, can also cause the adverse effect. And if we look at the total cost of the, the favipiravir treatment, will come up to 30,000 or 40,000 rupees for entire 10 days uh, period. Yes, if you believe that favipiravir helps, uh, you can prescribe favipiravir as soon as, soon as he, he's been diagnosed as COVID-19 uh, positive, along with the symptoms and signs. Medications which can be used for OPD management of COVID in pregnancy. Yes, as I mentioned, we avoid using the ivermectin. We avoid using the uh, favipiravir also. The only drug which can be used is the hydroxychloroquine, which is safe during the pregnancy. But however, in them also uh, try to manage the patients symptomatically. But, but if they continue to have symptoms and if they do not have the alert signs and symptoms, we can try hydroxychloroquine in them also. The evidence again is not clear, even in non-pregnant individuals also. But since we do not have any other options, if they continue to have symptoms and signs beyond the symptomatic, uh, the supportive care, one can also choose to use hydroxychloroquine in pregnant individuals. Okay, so hope this has, okay, there is a last question. Medications which can be used for OPD management of COVID in pregnancy that I've answered. Next is, sir, what should be the target blood sugar levels when treating with oral steroids in uncontrolled diabetic patients? Uh, as I told, steroids are not for all out OPD basis treatment. Steroids, as I again and again mentioned, it has to be after the viral uh, viremia phase gets over in a selected group of individuals where I mentioned alert signs and symptoms and especially more so if they're diabetic and uncontrolled sugar. Yes, if they're having symptoms and signs, you can start even in them steroids, but however, we need to give them medications to aggressively control their blood sugar. Whenever they're on steroids, ideal goal is whether we can, we can control the sugar as less as below 180, what the evidence shows, 
But however, if they have got sugar level beyond 250, 300, 400 all, we need to decide should we continue steroids or should we aggressively control the sugar either with the oral hypoglycemic agents or definitely it helps by adding the insulin, especially once a day, Lantus insulin, or you can add the atropid insulin if they are able to take the medications at home, or else we need to monitor or keep asking them every day what are their sugar levels. Because many of the patients, of COVID patients, are having lots of symptoms and weakness only because their sugars are high. And when we have controlled their sugars, within next 24 hours, they feel much better even without any specific treatment of the COVID infection. So hence, hence, please see that sugars are well controlled. More so if you have started on steroids, give them an advice, give them um, uh, advice that uh, they need to monitor their sugar and you need to be available to them to advise what medications they can take. Recently in news, few patients died after few days of discharge from hospital. Any cause attributed? Uh, I'm not sure uh, patients who have died and uh, we have not come across uh, that immediately after going home they have died. It is very vague that what may be the various causes. It may be the same cause that any other illness may be having. I'm not sure whether the COVID specific itself might have caused. But however, out of this, if they are thrombotic, if their d damage levels are high, maybe an MI, maybe a pulmonary embolism, or we do not know, maybe whether the need of oxygen itself might have caused, uh, uh, may cause the, the sudden death. But uh, uh, it is difficult to answer uh, because I feel once the COVID infection gets over and they are being discharged, they have the same uh, same uh, concerns, issues, as well as the complications than any other uh, any other patients is what I feel. But however, they may be having more of possible thrombotic episodes, either a venous or a arterial thrombus, which could be uh, MI, which could be a stroke, which could be a cerebral venous thrombosis, or which could be a ischemia of the intestine, which could be uh, ischemia of the limbs. So these needs to be a, a, a closed watch. Hence, frequent uh, speaking to them and frequent outpatient basis management, teleOPD will help to uh, detect such uh, events earlier and we can prevent is what I feel. Okay, with this, I would like to conclude and uh, you can still be in touch with me uh, if you have any, uh, if you have any uh, queries and you can leave a message uh, especially if uh, you are a medical person, so that uh, we can keep interacting and we can keep learning from each other. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am.